Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ray, and welcome to the RayWenderlich.com podcast. In this podcast, we'll keep you up to date with the latest app development tech talk. Now, here are your hosts, Drew Freeman and Nishant Shrivasta. Thanks, Ray. This is the RayWenderlich.com podcast. Welcome to episode 10 for season 11. This episode was recorded on Saturday, the 27th of March, 2021, for release on the 14th of April. This episode is sponsored by the Big Headphones, and you know what that means. I'm Drew Freeman with my Discordian co-host, Nishant Shrivasta. Thanks, Drew. Joining us in the episode today is Kate Houston, who is the engineering director at DuckDuckGo and an advisor at Glowforge, and has also contributed to the book, Living by the Code. Kate, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I was really thrilled when I saw Glowforge because uh, I have a very close friend with a glow. I'm assuming it's the the Glowforge, the the CNC laser cutter at your yeah. Thing. Oh, I have my. one right there. It's right there. I can see it. If you haven't it's seen wonderful. this, you we'll put this in the show notes. You have to look this up. It is a personal. Uh, CNC laser cutter etcher. You can cut wood. You can cut leather. Uh, etch leather. It's it's it, the thing's amazing. Yeah, it's really really fun. How did you it. wind? How did you wind up attached to them? Um. Yeah. I mean, I'm like Dan pinged me like ages ago, and he was like, "Hey, would you help me with this thing?" Um. I don't even remember what, but then I helped him, and then we just stayed in touch and like we're friends, and then um. When they were building out their team initially, I did a lot of their early technical interviews. And uh, as part of that, they made me an advisor. And, you know, like I helped them a lot at first, kind of building out their hiring process and like less and less over time. But, you know, like now it's like every so often, either Dan or the VP will ping me and we'll, we'll have a chat and I just, you know, try to be helpful. But I, I love them and I love the product. And like, yeah, it's just, it's an amazing opportunity and a great experience. Yeah, it's it's definitely an amazing thing. I I I, I wound up getting a three D printer because my friend has the Glowforge, and we wind up going back and forth on things. So yeah, it's really fun. I had the premium plan too, which like I actually really love because they give you a design each month, and it's like really complex and like pushes me to make something. And the April one, I'm so excited about. It's like a a little like jukebox, you know you can put your phone in it and it works as like a speaker. So um, I'm going to make it for one of my friends because I think she'll love it. And I'm going to like spray paint it in like rose gold and copper. It's going to look beautiful. I'm so excited. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Um, so my wife put together little medallions out of acrylic with the design she did because uh, they were able to etch the, the acrylic. So you have this sort of clear medallion with a symbol that looks almost like um, etched glass. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I got this fluorescent acrylic and I've been making these tiny fluorescent planters in like two tone colors. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. I'm like, I know I'm doing well because people are like, okay, do you have an Etsy store? I'm like, no, no, like I'm an engineer. Like these are just for friends. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how you're balancing. You have an engineer and then you get attached to an artist so that the artist can do the Etsy store and you can buy all the toys. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I did that was really fun is I am very into photography and I took a photo I, I had taken and I rendered it as a line drawing, cleaned it up a little bit and then engraved it on a piece of wood. Oh. You, that, using that uh, Glowforge uh, CNC machine or... Uh... With a different yeah. 3D print. Okay. Yeah, I nice. did it on the Glowforge. Yeah. And then, oh, yeah, actually, you know, you talked about making these with leather. I like, um, I wrote something in my own handwriting and I like turned it into a bracelet that I could just like wear on my, yeah. Nice. Super so, customized products. Obviously, yeah, it's so fun. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> But yeah, it's just, it's an amazing product. Um, we'll put the note, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. It's just a lot of fun. So obviously you are is, um, quarantining self, uh, yeah, everybody's in the house. I'm assuming you're working remotely right now. Yeah, well, I was always working remotely. And in Ireland, we've been in this very intense lockdown for like three months where we're actually not allowed to leave a five kilometer radius. 
five kilometer radius is the lockdown? Five, yeah, five kilometers. Oh, geez. And people ask me if I've left the state in the United States, and that's <laughs> that's miles and miles. Uh, just the idea of it being five kilometers, I'd barely get across town. Yeah, it's pretty full on. You know, I go back and forth, like I'm at peace with it, and I'm just like, ah, I'm so trapped. But, you know, mostly I've been, I've been trying to be pretty chill about the whole thing, because what can you do, really? So let me ask you, what what is fun for you when you are not locked down and not doing tech? Oh, I used to travel a lot, man. And I would go to a lot of art galleries. Like I love art galleries and like museums and exploring things. I love just like walking around cities and finding random things. Like that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I was like, like, I really love hanging out with my friends going to the theater like I'm like very into like travel and culture like the two things that have just been like off the table for the last year really um that must be crazy if you're down to five kilometers and you like to travel that just maybe that 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 would be maddening you know people were saying like Kate how are you coping with this but I've been like pretty fine we're pretty fine with that like the five kilometer when they shut the gyms that's when I start to struggle but you know it's, it's been, you know, an opportunity for me to explore Ireland. I used to joke that I only ever left Cork via the airport, you know, like I really haven't seen any of Ireland. I still have not been to Dublin, you know, and I've lived here for maybe three and a half years or something. Um, and, you know, we actually got to have a summer last summer and I, I like went and explored all these places that, you know, I hadn't got to before. So where are you originally from? Uh, the UK. But whereabouts? Oh, in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I'm from not London, from your, for your American listeners. Um, for Europeans, I'm from a place called Leicester. Leicester. Nice. Okay. Nice. We, we have listeners from all over the world. And, and I, I, I love being able to, to, to let the other listeners go, oh, this person's from right near me and everything else. So let me dive into some of what you're what we're we're doing here. And that is that our our big boss Ray Wenderlich was reading through the book, Living by the Code, and he thought these are really wonderfully cool people. And I love what they had to say. And I'd love to sit down at the bar with them and pick their minds a little more about some of what they had to say. And that's what we're hopefully gonna do today. I hope you're up and open to this. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful idea. You couldn't ask me anything. Well, one of the things that drew my attention was you were asked um, if a good if a good manager comes naturally, and you said that natural to you means high charisma, and not necessarily the experiential things you need. And I was wondering how you uh, how you manage what made you equate that feeling of somebody being a natural to charisma. Oh. Um, so often when people say, you know what, honestly, I guess it was an observation I saw somebody make is that there was somebody, you know, on a team that I was working with and on every objective measure, that person was doing a poor job, you know, but, um, my boss kind of observed to me, he's like, oh yeah, he's a natural leader. And I'm like, say what now? Because his team is miserable. They're not delivering. Like, what do you mean by this? And actually, when I kind of thought about it and dug into it, it's like this guy could own a room, you know, he could own a room and he could talk about what he was doing and, you know, make a good presentation about it. But actually, if you looked at like all the underlying metrics for how his team was doing, it was extremely poorly. Mm. Okay, so then that basically said the soft skills need to be there as well, and the soft skills may not necessarily come in if you've got the charisma. I think sometimes people skate by on charisma. Mm. Well, I mean, in, in the in the business world, I think people skate by with a lot of things that you know, <laughs> shouldn't happen. But but like think about you know think about interviewing right, um, and tech interviews are just like a mind, minefield of conflicting opinions, right? But it's been shown and documented that the least biased way to do hiring is actually to ask for work samples, right? And the most biased way is to have unstructured interviews. Now, why is that? Like, what's a big variable there, right? And charisma, I think, is one of the biggest, right? Along with your general bias factors, right? Like, 
when you have somebody's work, you can evaluate it, you can set criteria, you can say like, did they find these things? Is their architecture good on these objective, objective kind of criteria of like, is it testable? And if you just have a conversation with somebody, when we're like, yeah, they seemed really knowledgeable, like da, da 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 but you know, you don't actually know what happens. It's very hard to compare two conversations. And somebody who interviews well may not like be somebody who works well, especially over a longer period of time. Hmm. So then you basically said that the, the the really good things in a manager are the combination of self-awareness and humility. Mm-hmm. So how, how do those rank for you and, and how do they actually appeal in your world? Yeah, so I think the self-awareness is really key because as you gain power, you get less and less meaningful feedback. And so you have to start paying real attention to the implicit feedback and making sure that you're taking it on board um, because otherwise you just won't improve. Um, humility, I mean, I think, again, like as you gain power like your job scope you know it becomes bigger than what you can do by yourself right and so like admitting that you can't do it all yourself is like a pretty important step in kind of starting to delegate it out to other people and support them in it right like the worst managers are the ones who I think they can do everything themselves and then reluctantly accept they have to delegate a little bit and then micromanage Mm -hmm. out of all the delegation and just make you know like they don't scale right and if you can be like humble about your own limitations as a human being what you can take on what you can't take on then it just gives you a lot more space to let other people do things and sometimes they won't do it as well as you will do sometimes they will do it better than you will do and sometimes they'll just do it differently and you know accepting that that's the case is I think really really important to kind of scaling as a leader. I think the the quote that you have in the book really is fantastic. And that was humility means you have these conversations with the person, not their ego. And I, I just thought that was a, an amazing observation. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about coachability. I have a presentation I gave like late last year and, and an article in Quartz and a, another one that I need to publish somewhere. Um, And, you know, like, this is where self-awareness and humility come together, right? Because if somebody really needs to be seen a certain way, it's very, very hard to give that person feedback and help them grow. Mm -hmm. And when you can let go of this, like, need to be seen in a certain way, you kind of free yourself from what, in thanks for the feedback, they talk about as identity feedback, right? And if no feedback is identity feedback, inherently, you're much more open to receiving it. It's wonderful. That's a good point. Yeah. Because we are talking about this uh, coachability thing, um, I have one question that I've actually heard from other people is also that um, as an engineering manager, people expect that um, that they will have some sort of like, they, they, they are basically being promoted, say, from an engineer or a developer or like some other position into an engineering manager post. And they just get there because they have been stayed in this company for a longer period of time. So Sometimes they don't actually go through any coaching process or anything. So would mm-hmm. you suggest, or maybe maybe you can uh, share your thoughts around like, is this a, a good thing to do that they should they don't go through a coaching process and they d- directly jump into being an engineering manager or would be the other way around, like they should go through coaching? Um, I mean, there's different kinds of coaching, right? And so you know, there's like training programs for new engineering managers, which I think it's really important that people get some training, like it is a different job. Um, There's various ways that people might get that. There's plenty of companies have in-house training programs. Um, I love the lead devs programming. I think they're fantastic. And there's courses through that. Um, You know, at DuckDuckGo, um, we, we work through like one of our VCs has a connection to someone and then we take this training with people who have the same investor, I guess. Um, And I think that's really helpful for people to kind of embrace that mindset of it is a different job and give them like a starting point to learn from, right? Um, If somebody has that interest and like has that care and has been a tech lead and has had a good manager, you know, it's like really possible they'll move into management and they'll do an adequate job, right? The bar in tech is very low. 
Um, but, you know, it's a question of like, how do you find that baseline? And then how do you do the continuous learning, right? And, you know, then in the continuous learning, there's plenty of books that are available. Again, the lead dev has great programming. Um, and, you know, ideally you have a manager who helps you, right? I've trained a lot of managers. It's a lot of work, but it's really, really rewarding seeing them kind of grow and helping them, their teams grow. Then, you know, there's this question of mentorship, right? Maybe your boss can give it you, maybe not, but I think it's healthy for us to uh, get what we need from multiple people, right? Like not expect everything from our manager, like that puts too much on them. And, you know, at DuckDuckGo, we talk about you're the DOI of your career, which I love. I've always felt like I was the DOI of my career, right? And so I always had like, okay, my manager's giving me this, very variable. Um, and then I have various mentors, friends, people who I can turn to for whatever. And then for a long time, I've worked with a professional coach. And so for me, the professional coaching is really helpful because it is a place for somebody who just supports me, right? She's just there to help me be my best self. Um, I have continuity with her across various roles that I have been in. And it helps me, you know, to the earlier points about self-awareness and feedback, it helps me show on my feedback loops and really learn from it. Let's move from coaching and mentorship into sponsorship. Mm. Because as you mentioned, you, you'd said that the bar is low, but as you and so many other people have discovered, when you're an engineer that's female, that's not necessarily always the easiest bar to, cr to cross. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think sponsorship is really important. Um, and there's plenty of data that shows that under-indexed people, you know, particularly women, tend to be over-mentored and under-sponsored. They get all this advice, you know, but actually what people need to advance is they need opportunities and they need sometimes support to meet those opportunities, right? And I think it is, you know, the responsibility of people who have gained power <laughs> to pass that power on in a more equitable manner, right? And to look for under-indexed people in your organization and try and sponsor them which doesn't mean, you know, you're not sponsoring, you know, the, the majority, but like, sometimes I, I like to joke, you know, that white men don't have a word for sponsorship because mm -hmm. they just call it going to work. Very, very true. It's, it, it's, I, I, until you, you acknowledge that there's a problem, you're basically buried in your own privilege. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's true, but, you know, like one of the ways that inequi inequity has persisted, right, is that people want to help people who look like them. And sponsorship, I think the most important part of sponsorship is looking outside of that and like, how do you help the people who don't look like you? How do you help the people who don't look like who you see in senior leadership? Because the only way the numbers are going to change is if the distribution of power changes. So um, you mentioned that, that uh, like people should obviously should be sponsoring uh, people, those who are not looking like you. So we are kind of like in, uh, leading towards uh, talking about why people actually are not doing this because there's gender bias and, and, mm -hmm. and things around this. And I, I remember in the book, you mentioned something uh, like this is a super a nice line. And I like this where you mentioned it said inclusion is not a noun, it's a verb. Um, how do you see this differentiating the, the shift, the, the actions in, in tackling gender bias? Like how, how is this gonna be uh, something that people, if they start thinking about in this direction, mm -hmm. they can, they can uh, start tackling the gender bias uh, as a whole? Yeah, so I think it's really important that we don't just talk about gender bias, but we also talk about racial bias, right? Like we've had all the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, there's, you know, recently been these this terrible, you know, like murders of like particularly Asian women and attacks of Asian women um, and just like, like rampant racism, right? And, and very violent, violent racism with, with far reaching consequences. But, you know, one of the things that people like to say about diversity and inclusion is like people bring their whole selves to work, right? Which is like, okay, kind of true. Um, and, you can't set aside like structural inequity, right? Like people come to work with all the structural inequity that they've been experiencing, right? And the, dispar the, dis the disparity in opportunity, right? Um, so one of the things they found, like I think in the 80s, right? Like one of the biggest predictors of why women weren't getting into compu computing is because if there was a family computer, 
and they had the there was a girl and a boy the computer would be in the boys room and so like it was starting really early but then it was just perpetuated right it was perpetuated in the education system in the way that universities treated women right you know i remember when um when i was in uni we had to do a group course and i watched to the end of the course in horror as like all the women were um, there was 10 women in the course right and out of 100 and they divided up the teams and each team got a business student and a woman like which meant that the the girls went into this course like kind of inherently marginalized women right and so then it kind of continues and now you know somebody comes to work they've had less opportunity particularly along racial and gender lines they are, have been, you know, historically often mistreated, right? Like, I think one of the strongest predictors for how women do in this industry is what their first job and their first manager is like, you know? And this is like, I have the data and the observations for women, but I very much expect it's not just limited to women, but to, to all under index minorities. And so, you know, like you have this team and you have people who have been systematically treated in equity and you need to start redressing that balance, right? Like treating people equally or going, or treating everybody the same or going with like a majority vote does not result in changes to the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why stuff like use of language is really important, right? If you have a team of nine men and one woman and you take a vote, like who feels included if we say, hey guys, and you say, oh, well, 90% of the team feels fine about it. So we're all good. Like democracy that, not... is democracy yeah. is four wolves and a lamb voting on dinner. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I think, you know, when I talk about like inclusion as a verb, it's like, are you doing the work for the people on your team who have not historically been treated as well, who have not historically had the same opportunity and who may be experiencing disproportionate burdens like outside the workplace. And you point out that that people expect inclusion to be easy when in fact it's quite brutal. It's it's it it forces us to look at ourselves and not and and not accept the world as we have seen it. Yeah, and I I mean it's uncomfortable for people to confront their privilege sometimes. Right? To say like, "Oh, I had more opportunity." you know, and then kind of there's a subtext there of like, maybe I didn't earn what I had, you know, or earn what I have. Um, and like, I think that's where a lot of inclusion conversations get stuck because somebody's just in their feelings, right? And it's like, it's not about you, <laughs> you know, it's about how do we create more equity going forward? And how do we include people who have not been included and who may not expect to be included? So we have the problem what steps can we take to help this problem? Because I, I, I fully understand that concept of, well, we take a vote on something and, you know, 10% are the female voice, mm -hmm. but how, how do we fix these things? Do you have any general ideas or steps that you've taken? Yeah. I mean, I think something should not be voted on, right? Like I use that example because it's obviously ridiculous, but you know, it's your job as a manager to set the tone for your team, right? And, you know, I think the first step there is to really educate yourself on this and make sure that you're doing the work yourself. One of the ways that kind of structural inequity does get persisted, right? Is that we have a majority white male group in power, right? And, you know, they have this first step of in their feelings. And then they have the second step of like, yeah, okay, I've got through my feelings and we should do some things. And where do they turn? They turn to the under index people in their organizations and they find say a black woman and they say, hey, how do we do like racial equity here? Can you just, you know, and it's like, you think you're taking a step forward but you've actually taken a step back because now that woman does not have to just show up to work and do her job and be twice as good for half as much You've given her a second job of being the like single voice of racial and gender inclusion for your organization. I think one of the things that that one step that I'm seeing more and more companies take is leveled uh, the, the leveled playing field of salaries and positions where basically mm -hmm. if you're hired in as a senior engineer, 
that salary is set mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter who's being hired in at what. And if you are brought in as a junior engineer and move up to the senior engineer, you get that pay adjustment. Yeah. So I think salary equity and transparency is really important. Um, we have complete salary transparency at DuckDuckGo um, and absolute equity uh, geographically modulo like some kind of employment situations in the US versus elsewhere. But, you know, I know for the level I'm at, everybody else at that level is getting compensated the same way. Um, and I think that's really important, right? But I actually think that equality, like salary equity is important, but equity of opportunity is even more important because that actually is what affects your trajectory. So you're now at DuckDuckGo, which is, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, the Google that doesn't track you. Uh, so we like to call ourselves a privacy company. <laughs> <laughs> I realize you, you probably don't want to throw the competition around as... A... So do you do stuff other than searches then? Yeah, we have... Um... We have uh, mobile applications that are like search applications, but they also block tracking on the broader internet. Um, and we, yeah, we're doing a bunch of exciting things right now. It's like, it's a great time to be a DuckDuckGo. And you are development manager? Um, I'm uh, one of the engineering directors and I focus on the native application space. Did you come into the company as an engineering director or did you work up through positions? Yeah, I came in as an engineering director. So how was that interview process? Uh, <laughs> we do a lot of, think that Go does a lot of take home assignments. Um, but you know, this, the same was true at Automatic as well. Um, so yeah, I did, yeah, I did a leadership assignment and I did a technical assignment and then I, I did a technical design assignment and then I did a, um, like a team structure or team, like fixing team assignment. Mm -hmm. Like this fixing team assignment. Yeah, <laughs> that's my speciality, honestly. Like that's what I used to do. I mean, that's, that's the core core of the job. I would say that's, that's mostly used. Yeah, I mean, it depends, right? Like, you know, I definitely had some like, you know, my first team at Automatic, I joined and I got this like disconnected non-team, you know, and like a year and a half later, it was one of the highest performing orgs in the company, right? And, but it wasn't when I joined, right? And there was a lot of work to be done with that. You know, Duck Go, like, you know, things were not super on the team, but they were okay. And we've been, you know, it's, it's, it's different when you're trying to make a good team great than when you're trying to make a disconnected non-team achieve base functioning. You mentioned about uh, making the team productive. Uh, that's uh, that's a very important point because uh, a lot of like these uh, engineering managers who are like upcoming engineering managers and they are like basically trying to learn things. Uh, mm -hmm. They have this daunting task as uh, you just mentioned that making the team productive. So even yeah. though like, when we say it, it sounds easy, it's definitely not easy. So maybe would you like uh, throw some light on like what are the things that from your experience you would suggest that these engineering managers employ or use that could help them move towards productive teams? Yeah, so I have a whole talk on this, right? But like the premise of this talk is that everybody thinks their team is fine and you can't really measure it, right? And so actually like what I think most makes most sense is it's much easier to measure progress than state. So like, okay, you think your team is fine, whatever, let's say it's fine. How do you make it better, right? And then how do you, you measure that progress over time on like whatever metrics you particularly care about or like seem particularly lacking? Metrics are great because that is at least a way to give that report to say, see, there has been progress. Yeah, I mean, metrics, especially in terms of team health, right? Are like meaningless as a measure of state, right? So like, you know, if you're using story points to measure the state of your team, then you can say the team is better now, but you just gave every every story double the points, right? Mm. But if you, you know, if you keep everything the same, you say, all right, currently our story points are X and you start thinking about like, how do we get more done? How do we unblock each other faster? How do we collaborate so that people get help faster? And then you're like, all right, well now we're doing 25% more story points, you know? Like that metric is meaningful. So 
I have to turn that around now and ask because you came up with this beautiful term of something you don't like in the industry and that's success porn. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. Can you describe what you mean by that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if we go back to what we talked about at the beginning, the like self-awareness and humility, humility, success porn is like the opposite of that, right? And I think it also relates to structural inequity, right? Because mm. and often what you find in success porn is like somebody who started on fourth base, hit a home run, saying, I did this home run because I was excellent. So basically, you don't want people resting on their laurels. No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think it's great to celebrate your own achievements, right? But I think it is not good to tell other people that the only reason why they haven't achieved things is because they didn't work as hard as you. Mm, okay. So one of the things that you come across most in, in engineers um, for their own outlook of their knowledge is... Um, oh, I've just blocked the term in my head, um, imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the one person who hits a home run and feels like they're the best. Now we have to balance that with the engineers who are convinced that they aren't able to do what they're doing. How do you address mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I mean, I kind of hate the term imposter syndrome because I feel like it's a term that has become used to pathologize women for insecurity that's often a result of hostile environments you well, know I use, it, I use like, it on myself all the time sure but I think we need to differentiate between the way that imposter syndrome gets used as like you know somebody who has historically and systematically been told that they're inadequate because of who they are then feeling insecure right and then I think imposter syndrome also gets used to just kind of be like any insecurity right like the first time I so when I became a, a manager I was managing mobile teams and at some point I started managing my first non-mobile team right and like did I have imposter syndrome or was that actually like a piece of the growth opportunity that I had never done that before and I didn't really know what I was doing and I had to figure it out you know Absolutely. and then I think there is like this third thread, but like it's actually much smaller than maybe it gets attributed to, which is like, you know, irrational insecurity, right? And then, you know, if I have anybody that I'm working with who, you know, seems underconfident, then that's something I'm going to talk to them about and work with them on and kind of help them build their confidence, whether it is like, you're not in a hostile work environment anymore. <laughs> so like, people are not going to tell you whatever has been happening before, or you know, it's fine if you feel insecure about this, it's new for you and we're gonna help you. So what is the, uh, so now you, because now that you mentioned that we shouldn't actually use this, what's the alternative term? <laughs> what do you use to, to use? Uh, because I would uh, probably, all our listeners would also wanna know exactly what's the correct term they should be using. That would make um, more sense. I would say that like, there's a correct term or an incorrect term. I just think we should not overuse imp imposter syndrome for the things that are not really imposter syndrome. So, this is like a very feisty social justice episode. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like very spicy today. <laughs> you covered good good points. <laughs> it makes it fun. This is this is great. I'm uh, I find the the I, I find the social justice issues relevant. I mean, it is well. That's that's a, an understatement. I think it is essential at this point mm -hmm. that in the workplace, the workers are equal in as much as what they do, mm -hmm. um, and we have had that problem. Um, most bizarre example of that that I, I once had was that they had a pizza and ice cream celebration for our team and our team was African and Jewish and Indian and pretty much nobody could do cheese and when I came up and said can we do something other than pizza and ice cream they said no come on all you guys eat that stuff and there was no sense of yeah. of that and 
talking about it was like, well, why do you always bring this up? And it's like, because I'm the only one who's trying to take steps that you recognize our team for what it is. Yeah. I mean, I think there's different threads to the inclusion problem in the industry, right? The first is just like a fundamental lack of empathy, right? Which we see in products causing kind of continued structural harm, right? The second is very few tech companies manage to meet their hiring goals, right? But they're not really looking to hire from 100% of the population. Like, you know, the structural inequity, the bias, the bad processes is like, you know, dramatically cut their um, hiring kind of pull down, right? And then the third is um, power and money, right? Like if you look at the, like so many tech companies today mm -hmm. are in some way related to the PayPal mafia, right? Which, you know, was a very homogenous group containing some very problematic people, right? And it just gets perpetuated. And to come back to my earlier comment, like things don't change until the balance of power changes. Like that's true at different levels when, within your organization, you know, but it is also true as an industry until the shape of VC changes and that that becomes more representative, we won't see the same diversity of companies that we really need to do to actually be a net positive in the world. So let's, let's, Let's change gears for a moment. Not that this is not like the most important topic. Um, one of the questions that you're always tapped on in, in living by the code is some books that you read. Mm -hmm. And one of them, and your first one stood out to me, and that was leadership and self-deception, getting out of the box. And I love that, that book. This is this is like your number one book. What is it about that book that that is like your number one? Yeah. So I was recommended this book when I was interning at IBM and, you know, our manager asked us to read it. And it is for me, a fundamental book about leadership because it is all about how you show up to other people and what you do with power and feedback and all of this kind of stuff. Right. Like um, a lot of people talk, are talking now about radical candor, you know, for me, radical candor is like applied self leadership and self deception. You know, a lot of the, um, oh, I'm reading a, another fantastic book right now on feedback. Um, oh, I can't remember it, but uh, I'll give it to you and we can put it in the show notes. But a lot of these things, what they have in common is if you want to give somebody feedback, this may be hard feedback that they don't want to hear. If they can tell where you're coming from, is wanting them to be successful, you'll be able to do so much more with it. Right? And that for me is why it's foundational, right? Because you can learn whatever techniques you want, but if like fundamentally you're coming from a place of self-interest, you're not kind of putting the person first and kind of seeing them as a whole human being, it doesn't really matter what those techniques are. You're still going to get not the best reaction or not succeed. Similarly, if you're coming at somebody, you know, from this core place, um, and in corrective coaching, we call it the client is capable, whole and resourceful, which I think is another way to see it. If you're coming to somebody from that place, it doesn't matter if you don't do it perfectly, because they will still kind of see that you're trying to help them and your overall impact will be better. I love the fact that we've actually transcended beyond the concept of human resource and we're now emphasizing the human again in the workplace that it is important to treat them as a person not just somebody who does the work mm -hmm. so your comment was that it really is a good way to avoid conflict yeah i was saying in conflict one of the problems in conflict is people are often talking past each other and the thing that leadership and self-deception encourages you to do is to kind of step outside of like your viewpoint and your agenda and really understand where the other person is coming from and kind of try and have a human to human conversation there. Which is really hard to get nowadays, I would say, because um, I think everyone, uh, as you initially mentioned, have this like uh, the, the ego problem, which, which doesn't let you do that, right? Like talk to the other person uh, in a very human way manner connecting them and then doing the feedback stuff yeah I mean I think it takes a lot of work but you know I, I feel good that most of the time I managed to do it now I've worked really hard at it though for a long time 
the other thing I've been doing lately, my coach had me do this was um, this program called PQ, Positive Intelligence. Um, and initially I was, I don't know, I read it. I'm like, oh, this is very American, you know, but <laughs> but going through the program was like, you know, it's made me like a lot, a lot calmer, a lot less kind of reactive, you know, it's, um, and you know, a lot of what he talks about is, you know, it's very fundamental. Like it goes very well with the concepts in leadership and self-deception, for example. Would you recommend other people to also take this PIQ program? PQ? PQ um, yes. Yeah, I like, I found it great. <laughs> I found it really good. My coach is very into it. She's putting a bunch of people through it right now. Um, it is also like really expensive. So <laughs> it depends what people, <laughs> what people are looking for. But yeah, I mean, I find it really valuable. Would some resource related to this be available, like which people can check out later on? Yeah, so there's a book, which is, you know, a normal book price. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, quizzes online that you can take to kind of assess your PQ. Okay, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes for oh, people absolutely. to just reference. We're going to pack our show notes with this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I went, uh, I went through your blog post, which is kate.blog. We'll put that into the show notes. And there was a post on it uh, that was titled, Remote Team Managers Can Learn a Lot from Open Source Communities. So when I read this post, I was like, really, I liked that post uh, very much. Uh, could you like summarize this, um, this whole blog post that you had, like in a small key takeaway for our listeners, maybe a little bit elaborate a little bit on it also? Thank you. I'm so glad you liked it. Um, I think, you know, the core thing is to operate with transparency, put stuff in writing and give people space and encouragement to contribute. Now, a lot of this is, is wonderful, especially when your management is grasping onto all of this. I personally love to have you as a manager above me uh, because of all of this that you've done, but Every now and then, how do you deal with being, how do you deal with failures as being a leader? Um, yeah, I mean, if anybody would like to be managed by me, my team is hiring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, like, I think failure is really fascinating. I um, I did a panel for the lead dev on this recently. And, you know, I got four people that I really love and admire and, made each of them prep a very thorough detailed case study on one of their failures um and you know one of the things I wanted to do from that is like firstly get away from the kind of platitudes that I think undermine that kind of panel but secondly like normalize failure right especially in people that you admire like I probably fail every week in some way as a manager you know but to come back to that concept of leadership and self-deception right if I I'm operating with my team in a space of integrity where they know that I truly care about them. It's much easier for them to kind of forgive me my failures and also tell me, you know, like you missed this thing or I didn't feel like that meeting went well. Um, and, you know, we covered like so many things in the panel. I'd really recommend that people watch it. But, you know, I'll tell you one about my biggest failures as a manager, if you want. Um, and that is that... I ended up doing two reorgs in a three month period. Um, so we did a reorg and then we hired faster than we expected and in a different geographic split than we expected. And then we had to do another reorg. And I wrote this complete mea culpa for the team. I was like, look, I'm so sorry. You know, this was my mistake. I'm not happy that we have to do the second reorg, but you know, we knew it was going to come at some point, it's come sooner, because these things happen that we didn't foresee. And I'm sorry, you know, and um, I went back to that post as I was like prepping. And like the comments were so kind, you know, just because I had like admitted the mistake in public, um, and been really honest about it and explained why. And it kind of I think allowed people to feel how they felt about it, right? Like, <laughs> there like any anger frustration whatever was completely valid right like it was not what I wanted to do but also to kind of move forward as a team and kind of recognize that the reason why we were doing the second reorg 
kind of tied into one of our core values as a team that we wanted to really onboard people well and set them up for success. And we couldn't do that without doing the second reel. Sounds uh, very much like uh, or how we see it, uh, leading by example, but not just for success, but also for like your failures, mistakes, uh, the things that we are doing, we are, uh, we are accepting that. That's a very nice. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I think it's even more important to lead by example when things don't go well, right? Like it's very easy to be, <laughs> to be like doing a good job at like, oh, things are great. And it's much harder to be doing that when things are not going great or when you've made a mistake. Now, and this is a really great example of, of keeping the humility in there, which is something you've said makes for a very strong leader. Now, you talked about doing reorgs. And personally, I hope this hasn't happened to you at this point. But have you had to deal with layoffs? Yeah, I had How, to fire half my team in my first management job. Yeah, it was so, yeah, could the you, worst could day you, of my professional career. <laughs> can you yeah. give me some, some detail? Because a lot of engineers who are going to be listening to this, they've been on the other end. They've, they've yeah. been the one who's been told, go home. Most people never know what is going on through the mind of the person who makes that decision. So can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, this is like a brutal, but, but an excellent question. Um, and I did say you could ask me anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. We try. We, we try. <laughs> Keeping no, that promise. <laughs> it's good that people only know the side of it of like being told to go home right because like those are the people who ultimately their lives are most affected by it right um being on the other side of it is is horrible too you know because you have to make decisions about you know people's lives and you probably know you know like who your best engineers are. You could probably stack rank them if you really had to. And like, yes, everyone has different qualities or whatever, but fundamentally, you know who it would be hardest to live without. But you also know who would have an easier time getting another job on that too, right? And you know who, you know things about people's lives as well, right? Like, you know who has more dependence. And um, that makes it very, very difficult, you know, to make, those decisions. Um, when when we had to do it, um, the, the CEO honestly did everything that you should not do. <laughs> he got everybody into a call and he <laughs> said some things, oh my God, you know, um, told, I mean, he was dreadful, right? My manager and I, we really tried to do the best by our team. We were both pretty stressed by it. We were both miserable by it, about it. And, um, you know, we fought over it, you know, we like had a call where we were like yelling at each other, right? And I'm not a yeller. Um, and, you know, so we, we went through this thing together and then um, it turns out that we agreed, you know, we agreed on like who needed to stay and who needed to go. And, you know, we did our best to negotiate or like he in particular, like tried to negotiate for everybody on the team. And, um, yeah, we, we, I laid off half my team. It was horrible. I cried <laughs> a lot before and afterwards. Um, and then, you know, I asked myself, who did I want to be in the situation? And, you know, I would always tell my team, like, I'll be your manager for some amount of time, but I will help you for as long as you'll let me. And so I tried to, like, help everybody who had laid off, like, find their next job. And, you know, look out for them. And like, I still stay in touch with people I've fired, which I consider to be a huge achievement. I've, uh, I've been on, well, it'd be remiss for me to say, I've been on both ends of the, uh, of the layoff being just dropped unceremoniously by a company that was basically falling apart. And then for one company that their entire process was they didn't so much lay you off as they moved you into a non-active team for three months while they actually nurtured you into finding your next position. I wish all companies did that, but that's financially really expensive and that's, yeah. that's, that's crazy. But, um, you know, I, I, I have, I guess had the privilege not to, uh, 
lay off a team yet. I've had to take corrective actions against uh, a few engineers who, who have not pulled. So I was going somewhere with that. I really was. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think any of these things are, are horrible um, and they should be horrible, right? Like if you enjoyed firing people, you would be a sociopath. Um, and, you know, ultimately, like this is one of the things I remember a new manager said to me once that, you know, you have to hope that you never have to fire anybody. And I was like, you need to understand that that may be your job. And you can do everything you can to avoid it, but you have to do that work. You can't just hope it won't happen. And so for me, you know, this is something I think about when I'm performance managing somebody, right? And if I have to have conversations with somebody that suck, you know, I'm like thinking about like, if ultimately I had to fire this person, would I be able to live with myself? Would I know that I had done everything I could to help them be successful, mm -hmm. right? And taking that mindset into things means that I've fired people and I've not lost sleep about it, right? But I've also retained and advanced people who it didn't seem would go in that direction because I really made the effort to give them the feedback and make sure that they heard it and help them change if they were open to it. Like the, the the point that you made that you nurtured them through the process of like making sure that they, they don't end up being on the other end. That's something that maybe uh, at least the new engineering managers don't actually have that in the mind because they are, as I said, like probably they are just like moving into this position um, and their idea is completely different. So that's something I, I personally, I think uh, is something maybe I will remember and hopefully our listeners too, uh, if that, that time comes in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look, like, if you dread firing somebody, like get really good at giving people feedback early. Yeah, that's, yeah, there, there's, every job has something that is very difficult and you sometimes have to climb into that and, and uh, embrace some of the darkness that is, is innate in most jobs. That actually brings me to a question. So, uh, because I've actually, I, I know some people who have actually been in a situation where they knew that they were going to be laid off or, or they, they, they could perform, but they were not actually nurtured by the engineering manager or helped through. So what is the course of action maybe for them um, if they do need the help from the manager, but they are not getting it somehow? Or like, what, would, what should they do in that scenario? Yeah, I think that would vary per person, you know, like it depends where the gap is and how big the gap is. But I think most importantly, it depends on like whether the person wants to fill it, you know, it's like you could be good at your job, but would you like it? You know, because if the answer is no, you wouldn't like it. Like maybe you should be looking for another job, which you could be good at and also like. All right. So We've been talking about some dark areas and some <laughs> difficult areas. I want to lighten things up for a few. So you say that you are, for the most part, a remote develop, uh, a remote. Um, I don't even want to say developer at this point. You're you're a remote uh, manager at this point. Yeah, um, don't take it away from me. Sometimes I write code on vacation. Yay. <laughs> um, what's your uh, what's your language of choice? Um, it depends. Like if I'm just, uh, my most recent thing, I like wrote a little script and I did it in Python, but you know, if I'm going to make a little iPhone app, then I do it in Swift or yeah. I haven't used Kotlin yet, but if I was going to write Android, I would write some Kotlin. So now you were remote before the pandemic hit. So I'm assuming that we're talking to you in your office, so to speak. Yeah, this this is my office. Isn't it beautiful? How do you uh, how do you keep? This is a question I've I've asked most people. The morning. How do you keep your discipline, especially because that looks like a sky chair behind you, and I'd probably not come out of that. Oh my god, it's great. It's uh, it's like a hanging egg chair. So like, it's very soothing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just like very much a creature of habit. You know, I just try to be at my desk by 10 and, you know, once I'm here, I focus. Um, I don't do anything else here, which I think helps. Like, it, I feel very fortunate to have a, 
dedicated room to work. Um, my, my partner and I uh, moved in together over the course of the pandemic. And there was a period where he was working in the kitchen and sometimes we were sharing the office and like, you know, we sacrificed my perfect guest room to be his office, which is, does not meet the aesthetic standards of the rest of my house. Um, but it's actually been like a huge improvement for both of us to, to have each an office. I understand the idea of having your guest room be your office. I, I am more than familiar <laughs> with that. And viewers can see the bed behind me with the plushies. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, we had to, we had to do some things that, you know, it's, it's so much better. So I think, you know, I have a place to go. I start my day at a similar time each day. I mean, it's all just like very predictable. And I have an expectation and habit of focus here. So it, it's been pretty easy for me overall. And you're one of the people who will sit on a uh, sit on an exercise ball instead of a chair, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm on an exercise ball right now. I love it. It's just like you have so much more movement. I'm like balancing. <laughs> <laughs> I got to try this, I think. <laughs> yeah, totally you should. Um, now, you didn't mention Pomodoro by name but you do take regular breaks when you're doing your work is that correct um, yeah i mean i need more tea so. <laughs> tea is yeah, a continual thing right yeah i don't do pomodoro or anything like that honestly like i'm kind of like a hyper focused person so if i start doing something i may like lose all track of time drives my partner up the wall I'll be like you're gonna go to bed I'm like why it's seven o'clock and he's like no no it's not <laughs> when you switch off from work how much is still on yeah I mean you know like my job now is great you know so I finish work I'm fine if somebody somebody can test me if there's a problem but they'll probably just deal with it um, I think, you know, my last job was kind of cognitively easier, but emotionally harder, you know, and then it was much more difficult to, to switch off. But yeah, like, you know, for me, at the end of the day, I turn off my lamps and leave my computer and just let it all go. Okay. But you, uh, you mentioned that you do keep the, the slack running and you do run even when you're on a train trip. Um, not anymore. Like I've never put, like since I switched jobs, you know, we use Mattermost, not Slack, and I've never put it on my phone. Like there's just never been any need to. I used to put it on, you know, like my last job for travel, I would have it on my phone because um, I would need it for communication. But since we don't travel anymore, like no need to put anything on my phone. I don't even <laughs> have my work calendar on my phone anymore. That's something that I actually have been doing for a couple of years now. And I don't put um, work applications on my phone. I mean, if I have a different phone, let's say a company provides me, then maybe the apps are there, but not on my, my personal phone, which I'm mostly carrying around. Oh, I, yeah. wish, I, I wish I were that lucky. I have a, my, my company that I directly worked for gave me this little PC and I'm supposed to be checking mail all the time on it. And I almost never use it because I'm actually a contractor for another company where I use a Mac because I do iOS, et cetera. And, and I, I, this PC, does, PC and I do not get along. So I wound up putting my work mail onto my iPad just so I could, just so I could use it in a familiar environment and, and go from there. But I, yeah. I don't think that's I don't think that's so much putting it on the personal device as it is taking it in a place where I can process it better. Yeah, totally. I used to put all my like work apps on my Android phone. Um, and then, you know, even if I was traveling, for example, I would still have a, like a purely personal iPhone. It's like I run a cross platform team. I think it's important that I'm like using both platforms. Mm hmm. So, Kate, we have been talking about um, the how engineering managers manage teams and like there's like so much um, goes into making sure their team is productive. And we often also talk about like the, the developers and engineers, they are also going through this burnout phase, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when this is happening for engineering managers, this is usually not kind of like talked about or maybe most people don't even 
mention how this looks like so if you have ever experienced this or have kind of like mentored another engineering major who has gone through something like this maybe you could share something around how it maybe looks like and how would someone who goes through this process would be able to cope with it yeah so i actually wrote a blog post a while ago it was called the cost of fixing things and it was like you know fixing teams is very emotionally draining and it, it leaves me burnt out um you know and i came into the pandemic feeling pretty pretty burnt out you know and i obviously changed my job which helped a lot but um you know my usual strategies of like feeling less burnt out <laughs> were not there for me you know i couldn't go on adventures i couldn't go to art galleries like i couldn't you know, like between the job where I had to fire half my team and, and working at Automatic, I like traveled to Tuvalu. Like I really just like left human civilization and went to the edge of the world and just like left it all behind. Um, and I, you know, so last year I really had to kind of learn to unburn out where I was at. Um, and you know, I feel like that's been a process, <laughs> like finally getting somewhere, but you know, there was definitely a period where I was like, what's pandemic burnout? And what's the burnout that I knew I had before the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is this framework for burnout that I find really helpful. It's called Maslach's, um, Maslach's Hierarchy of Burnout. Um, and it talks about the five kinds of burnout that are not overwork, right? So overwork is one cause of burnout, but also there is lack of community, misalignment in values, lack of control, um absence of fairness um and then one more which i feel like i always forget but if you think about the way that we're living right now right like community and control are, are big ones that the people have lost and so everybody is more susceptible to burnout um it's a very isolating period for everybody and so you know it becomes even harder and uh Think something that I've I've often found hard in this past year is that even when I think I'm doing okay, a lot of people I love are struggling, right? And so inherently, for me at least, I can't do that well when, you know, none of my friends are that happy. Um, and you know, I, I find the Maslow's hierarchy really helpful um, because it helps you know where you need to go with it, right? So if I if I feel like the lack of control is a big one, you know, then I can try and kind of regain some kind of control such that I can in the constraints that I have, right? Um, similarly, the lack of community, there's things that we can do to like facilitate and increase our like human connection. And if you know that that's a problem, then you can do it. So whenever I'm talking to somebody who's seeing burn, who's seeming burnt out, you know, like the first one is always just like take some time off. You know, I've been telling people on my team a lot, it starts to seem a little fired. It's like, why don't you take a long weekend? You know, um, because one of the things that I'm observing in this, like in the darkest timeline is that people's downtime is much lower quality and there's no forcing function to take it. Yeah. Um, so pushing people to take that, but then, you know, like looking at these other themes, like is somebody seeming lonely? You know, is that something that I can encourage them on? is you know somebody just feeling this like real absence of control and kind of it's showing up at work in some way it's like well you know can I help them realize that they need to feel a little more in control and, and kind of facilitate some way to do that so so that's generally how I how I work with it I think I'm I'm uh, bitten by this bug of not taking enough leaves <laughs> let's just say and I, I can see that like when you when you explain this everything was fitting into pieces and I'm like, okay, Dishan, I'm, I'm booking my beliefs next week. Yes, do it, do it. <laughs> You're not the first person that I've done this to in conversation. So, you know, don't worry. And then, you know, like for me personally, I used to write a lot, you know, I probably used to consistently write more every month than I did in the entire of 2020 and 2021 is on the same path, right? But I still feel this, need for progress you know in my career of which my job is just a piece right and uh you know one of the things that I have accepted that I need right now is just a little bit more structure in it you know so I've been taking courses 
right? I'm like working on my coaching certification. Um, and, you know, I got through a lot of life debt, right? And so I've had this mindset of like, all right, I'm finding it very hard to write right now. I'm going to try, but I'm also going to do the things that like future Kate, who I very much hope will be able to write again, will be like, well, I'm glad those things got dealt with. <laughs> this is great. Because you're talking about this uh, writing consistently for like, say, at least 2020 and then now continuing 2021, this is something that I actually found out. You have been, po- you have this like super amazing streak of posting a photo <laughs> daily since 2017. Um, and the, uh, the, the website where uh, our listeners can actually go to is called photo.kate.blog. We'll put it in the show notes too. But can you like maybe just talk about like where, how did you just come up with this? Because it's really nice. I, I went through the whole thing. It's like super oh, nice. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you like it. Um, so I used to work on the WordPress apps. And um, it was a way to force me to use the app every day. And um, the media experience was terrible. It was really, really poor. And I, for what I'm very into like personal health trackers. And I had this tracker that was like a stress monitor, you know? And uh, it would go off every time I posted a photo. And I was like trying to get, you know, we like had a project, we were making progress and I was not happy with the level of progress. And I sat down the lead engineer on the team and I was like, watch this. And I like posted a photo and then I'm like, here's the alert. This sets off my stress tracker every time you need to fix this. (laughs) Um, And, you know, like, so at first it was kind of for that, but like over time, you know, it's just, I really like it. You know, I, I like having, you know, this little snapshot of how I'm seeing the world every day. And I find it like a kind of a helpful metric for me, you know, like I know I need to try and get out of my like bubble or whatever, when I'm like always just like scrolling back through the archives to find a photo for today. When I stop taking photos, I've like stopped experiencing the world. Now, you started this, uh, I think, in 2017. Were you in Ireland at that point, or were you somewhere else? Uh, no, I was nomadic. I think I was living in Argentina then. So you, you've, you've lived in many countries. You've been in Ireland, Argentina, Canada, the States. China. Colombia, Australia. Andorra, All over the world. <laughs> Portugal. It must be okay, so absolutely China. F- Do you have a favorite? um yeah Andorra is my favorite country what what how so um so people that speak French and Spanish so do I there is tapas and crepes favorite food there are exceptional spas tax-free shopping and fantastic skiing like what is not to love about that whole situation (laughs) so how many languages do you speak I speak conversational French and like functional Spanish. I'm like a toddler with a credit card. (laughs) That's a good way to put it. Yeah, but you know, like Colombia is such a wonderful place to live if you're trying to work on your Spanish. Like the Spanish spoken in Colombia is just very, um, I don't know, like uh, it's, it's easier for beginners to pick up. And, you know, I loved Colombia. It's like such a beautiful country. So many interesting things to see. Like I met such wonderful, you know, people are just very kind there. I feel like Ireland is kind of like Colombia, but cold, you know, because Irish people tend to be also just like very nice and cheerful. You're talking about about all of this sitting at home. I want to go out and travel. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. At least you live in Berlin. Berlin's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, you say it is. We, we we are we are hoping Drew Drew would, would visit me sometime and maybe oh. we can also move him for a job or something. I <laughs> would still happily, on the card. I would happily <laughs> move for 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 a good job. I think I, I think that this this travel and wanderlust is a wonderful way to tie things up because it's been a, a wonderful journey. Uh, Kate, I really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, like, thank you for the fantastic questions. Oh, that's what, that's what we're here for. We try to, to come up with things that, that make it fun and challenging. Thank you for enlightening 
us and the listeners, obviously, with all the experience that you have and all the nice um, points that you had to add. It's, uh, I'm, I learned a lot in this episode, for sure. Amazing. Thank you. If you want to find Kate online, you can find her on Twitter at Kate HSTN. That's C A T E H S T N. Much smaller version. Nishant can always be found anywhere on the internet at N I S Rules, R U L Z. And I am Podcast Drew, D R U. We have two more episodes left in this season, and they are sort of two little special episodes. You, we've been asking all the questions, but no one's actually made us stand up for ourselves on this one. So this time we're going to open the bar to each other. On the next episode, I'm going to be on speaking about public speaking. That sounds a bit redundant and meta, but we've been talking about public speaking a lot with many of our guests, and I've uh, actually taken courses and done some public speaking, and we're going to take a deep dive and take a look at uh, some of the secrets behind it. Two weeks after that, Nishant is going to be talking, and if you have any questions that you have for Nishant and want him to talk about or have any questions before he does his episode, we want you to definitely email us at podcast at raywendelik.com. But that is going to tie things up for this episode. Again, I really thank Kate and Nishant. I am Drew Freeman, and we will return to the Emerald Castle. Ray, back to you. And that's a wrap. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the RayWendelk.com podcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and don't forget to leave a rating on iTunes. See you next time.